On December 24, 2002, shortly after 5.15 p.m., I received a phone call and heard the devastating words that forever changed my life. Lacey's missing. I knew in my heart that something terrible had happened to my daughter and my grandson. My world collapsed around me. This is an adult missing person, eight months pregnant. You can find no reason for her to be missing. None at all. One of the big things is the victim profile and looking at your victim, especially with the circumstances you have here, holidays coming up, family plans, get-togethers, uh, being pregnant, getting ready to give birth. He couldn't say what he was fishing for. He didn't know what kind of bait he was using. They had the cop gut instinct that something just isn't right. Did you murder your wife? No, no. Uh, I did not. And I had absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And he used the word murder. Um, and right now, everyone's looking for a body. And that is the hardest thing because that is not a possible resolution for us. And use the word murder, and yeah, I mean, that is a, a possibility. It's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night. Hi, welcome back to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. And today's episode is A Most Selfish Act, The Killing of Lacey and Connor Peterson. Now, it's been nearly 14 years since the bodies of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son Connor. They washed up on the shores of the San Francisco Bay. In 2004, Scott Peterson was convicted of their murders and then sentenced to death by lethal injection in 2005. He's still living on death row in San Quentin State Prison, as his attorneys continue to appeal his sentence to the Supreme Court of California. Now, the case against Scott Peterson was largely circumstantial. In fact, the only forensic evidence identified was a single hair, thought to be Lacey's, which was found in a pair of pliers on Scott's boat. Still, the circumstantial evidence was overwhelming, and it convinced the public, the media, and most importantly, the jury of his guilt. Of course, this is a very publicized case that everyone is familiar with, us included. So in preparing for this episode, Dick and I have made efforts to examine the Peterson case from new aspects and from available resources that we've found. We plan to address the psychology, the family relationships, and the legalities involved. And I've also discovered that there is a group of people who believe Scott didn't get a fair trial and could be innocent of the murder. Yes, there's a sizable faction yes. involved here. There is. Surprising. It is to me. Yeah. I mean, it, the, all the stuff you read sounds pretty cut and dried that he did it. It does, yes. But before we get into it, let's go ahead. I see you've brought a great beer. I have. So what I got today is this beautiful California beer. I chose one of the premier California breweries, Stone Brewing, and I picked their 20th anniversary beer. It's called Citricado, and like I said, this is their 20th anniversary, so they've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. I've been drinking their beers for a long time. Citricado is a beer made with citra hops and honey from avocado flowers. Oh, wow. That's where the name comes from. Okay. It's an IPA, and we don't have to talk about what an IPA is because we've done that many times before. Yes, refer to earlier episodes if right. you're not aware of what an IPA is. So this one poured a dark amber color with a small tan head. The aroma was citrus, tropical fruit, and honey. A fairly pronounced honey smell, aroma. I didn't know honey really had a smell. Sweet. Okay. And there's a little bit of pine. That's from the hops also. The taste up front is pineapple. Very pleasing. Mmm, that sounds good and honey, and some pine, and then there's a late kind of blast of grapefruit. A blast? A blast. <laughs> it, it kind of intensifies on the palate. Okay. And the, the mouthfeel is like that too. It, it's hoppy, and it gets increasingly hoppy, and the, the hops really lingered nicely. So oh. I, I love this beer. Okay. So it's I a hope good I review. find some more. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dickie. Now let's slide on down to that dimly lit, quiet end of the bar where we can talk about what I think is a most selfish act, the killing of Lacey and Connor Peterson. I think there's a pretty good story to tell here. Yes. 
hopefully we'll have some new stuff that not everyone has heard before. I think we do. Good. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Okay. So Lacey Denise Roca was the second child of Dennis Roca and Sharon Roca, who met in high school and married shortly after they graduated. Now Lacey's big brother Brent was born in 1971, and Lacey herself was born in 1975. Her parents separated after Lacey's first birthday, so she was raised by her mom and by her stepfather Ron. According to her family and friends, she was a very outgoing and chatty girl. She was actually a cheerleader, and she was always very smiley. After high school, Lacey went to California Polytechnic State University, majoring in ornamental horticulture, and her dream with that was to someday open a plant shop. So it was while she was a student at Cal Poly that Lacey met Scott Peterson. And in December 1996, Lacey and Scott became engaged to get married. They married in August of 1997. Lacey became pregnant in 2002 after wanting to be pregnant for about two years. She was actually thinking of going for fertility tests at that point, but ended up getting pregnant. And the last people known to have spoken with Lacey on December 23, 2002, were her half-sister Amy and her mother Sharon, who talked on the phone with Lacey around 8.30 p.m. that evening. So Lacey was reported missing on the 24th, Christmas Eve, and a neighbor found the Peterson's dog running loose in the neighborhood that morning around 10.15 a.m. Scott returned from his fishing trip that day around 4.30 p.m., and Lacey's car was in the driveway, the dog was in the yard with his leash on. Lacey wasn't home. Her purse, her keys, and her wallet were on the kitchen table. And Scott called Sharon Roca at around 5.20. So that was about an hour after he got back. He'd eaten pizza, he'd showered, and he'd put some of his clothes in the wash. And he called Sharon Roca, Lacey's mom, and asked if Lacey was with her. Yeah, so he apparently wasn't too concerned about her disappearance or not being there because he did all these other things before yeah. he called. But then then something made him decide to call. You know, you wonder if if they have this kind of relationship where they're not in touch with each other all the time, and he gets home and, and she's not there, and he doesn't find that too unremarkable. In that case, why does he call and say she's missing? Yeah, most people thought that it, it wasn't normal for him to come home and not find her there. I mean, she was almost eight months pregnant. And it was Christmas Eve, and they had plans to go and have dinner with Lacey's parents that afternoon. So Sharon, she told Scott that Lacey wasn't there, and that's when Scott told her, according to Sharon, that Lacey was missing. And she found that wording odd, she would say later on. So Scott told Sharon that he had left to go golfing that morning, and Lacey was planning to walk the dog and go grocery shopping. Now he had a couple of different stories about what Lacey was doing when he left, one of them was that she was sitting at her little table curling her hair, her little dressing table. Mm -hmm. And another one was that she was getting ready to mop the floor and had the bucket out. Okay. Now, Lacey's stepfather was the one to call the police around 6 p.m. And a search of the park and neighborhood began very quickly. Police, family, friends, and neighbors searched on foot. And then all-terrain vehicles, even helicopters, water rescue units, search dogs were all used to uh, look for her in the area. There was a park nearby where there was an idea that maybe she was going to walk the dog there, right off their neighborhood. So that's but, one of the areas they really searched. Yeah, and in any event, she wasn't there. Well, no. And, you know, it's, it's just this whole initial thing seems a little odd to me. Okay, tell me that, what uh, you're thinking. You know, well, I'm yeah. thinking, the, the first thing is that he knew what was going on. I mean, he's truly guilty of what he did. So he gets home and dicks around for an hour or so. Sure. And then calls his mother-in-law to say she's missing. So now I'm thinking if he's innocent, he probably doesn't use the word missing. He just says, Lacey's not here. Well, that's what a lot of people think. Yeah, and, you're not alone in that. And we're supposed to be at your house pretty soon for a Christmas Eve dinner. So, yeah. so why does he say she's missing? Well, I think yeah. one thing he said is that he thought maybe her, her parents came and picked her up for dinner, which would make no sense. Right, it wouldn't. Right. And then why would he say she's missing? I don't know. I mean, he, 
just wording. I don't know if it's that significant. I know, but I'm trying to parse through things and uh-huh. and think about it. On the other hand, if he gets home and here she is, eight months pregnant, not real mobile. Yeah. And probably not maybe housebound, but at least not doing too much. I would think and, so. And he gets home and he's thinking that she should be there and she's not there. Why does it take him an hour or so before he decides to call anybody? Right. A lot of people were asking that very so, question, yeah. They're supposed to go to her parents' house for dinner. He's expecting her there. She's not there. The dog's there in the yard just on the leash, so he knows that, geez, something probably went on. Right, And right. it still takes him an hour to call somebody. Yes, it is strange. And so, a lot of people even remarked that it was strange that he would even have gone out golfing or fishing. Right, and that's that's a whole other thing. Yeah. He initially said he was going golfing. And yes. I, you're going to talk about this later, but yeah. here's another part of it. But it was too cold to golf, so he decided to go fishing, where it's probably even colder on the water. Yes, and he so, went um, about 90 miles away. And he, he drove a considerable distance to go fishing. Yes. So that just sounds kind of weird, too. It but does. Anyway, I, I digress for you. Well, there are a lot of inconsistencies, and I think that's part of the reason that the police initially became suspicious of Scott. Yeah, I guess they, they arrived at the scene, and they weren't immediately identifying Scott as a suspect, mainly because his family and friends absolutely believed he wouldn't have harmed Lacey. Right, yeah. But they eventually became a little suspicious due to his lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. I guess that's in terms of all the different stories he told. Yes. And his odd behavior. Then the bombshell. About three weeks later, a woman called Amber Fry or Frey. Yeah. Most people say Fry. I think it's Fry. Yeah, although it's spelled like Prey, P-R-E-Y. So, but anyway, <laughs> I'll just call her Amber. Okay, that's a good idea. So she called police uh, in January, mid-January, to tell the police that she was in a relationship with Scott. Yes. Uh, and this was after she found out who he was. And I think you'll talk about this some more, but... We will, yeah. Um, he he was okay. seeing her and in a relationship with her, a, a fairly deep relationship, but he didn't want her to know that he was the husband of the missing woman. Well, sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very odd. So once once this came out, Lacey's family stopped supporting him. Yes, I think they were angry at that point. They were. And it turns out that he had had several extramarital affairs. Yeah. And just Amber was the most recent one. Right. He had also told Amber that he had lost his wife and would be spending his first Christmas alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Prophetic remarks. Yes. And this was apparently a couple weeks before Lacey's disappearance. Yeah, that he said this. That he said this, but the Roca family thinks this is more proof or more evidence that Scott was the one who killed Lacey. Yeah, that he was actually planning ahead for it. Right. Right. So Amber agreed to allow the police to record future calls with Scott in hopes of getting a recorded confession. Mm -hmm. They didn't get a confession, but they did get some interesting information about Scott's personality. They certainly did. These Holy were, uh, cow. These were some strange things that he said some strange things. His behavior was really odd. That's uh, putting it mildly. Yeah. But it wasn't until April 13th of 2003, so almost four months after, that the remains of a late-term male fetus were found on the shoreline of San Francisco Bay. And it was the very next day a partial female torso was found in the area. And this was a torso missing hands, feet, and head, which I hate to even say it. It's a horrible thought. Yeah. Well, limbs, too. It wasn't just hands and feet. It was... It was like the legs, too. Yeah. But I don't know if it was the whole... I think it was like half the leg. It, it wasn't the whole leg. Yeah. Yeah, and these remains were identified as Lacey's and her unborn baby a few days later. Autopsies were performed, but due to the decomposition and the missing body parts, for lack of a nicer way to put it, the cause of death couldn't be determined. Now, the medical examiner did note that Lacey had suffered some broken ribs, and he was able to tell that these were broken prior to her death. So this was news to me. I never knew that she had any injuries they could note prior to death. Right. Yep. And the FBI and the Modesto police, 
Then they did thorough forensic searches of the Peterson home, Scott's truck, the toolbox, his warehouse, and his boat, and he was actually arrested by special agents of the California Department of Justice Felony Enforcement Task Force, and that was a few days later on April 18. He was in the parking lot of Torrey Pines Golf Course, where he said he was meeting his father and brother for a game of golf. This is when he had his hair was dyed, kind of an orangey blonde, and he yes. had a goatee. He looked very pretty. Yeah. So a lot of people took that as an attempt to change his appearance. And some some strange things were found in his possession. I think you have a list of what was found in his car. Yes, you, this yeah. is an interesting compilation of things. So they arrest him. And it's almost like he's getting ready to go on the lam. Mm -hmm. Because they found about $15,000 in cash. They found four cell phones. Yeah, that's that's something. Multiple credit cards. Yeah, and they weren't all in his name either. No, they were various family members. Yes. An array of camping equipment, including knives, implements for warming food, tents, tarps, and a water purifier. Nine pairs of footwear. <laughs> well, you got to have the right shoes for the right occasion. Several other changes of clothing. A T-handled double-edged dagger. Ooh. Yeah. Maybe that's an all-purpose hunting knife or something. Maybe. A MapQuest map to F Amber's workplace. And this was disturbing to Amber. Well, yeah. If that made her think. She's, she's thinking maybe she, in his mind, knows too much and she's going to be gotten rid of. Yes. A shovel, some rope, 200 blister packs of sleeping pills, hmm. <laughs> some Viagra. <laughs> So do you think the sleeping pills were for possible suicide plan if he got caught? Or I wonder if those were just to help him sleep. I couldn't find any information on if he took sleeping pills regularly. Yeah, and, and I don't know that he'd need 200. So <laughs> I'm thinking might have been. it might have been that he was planning on harming himself or that he was going to drug Amber Ooh, I and didn't even think of do that. away with her. Yeah, or maybe not do away with her, but I also thought maybe he was going to kidnap her. And take her away with him. There have been crazy guys that have done that. That's true. And drug her. Yeah. And the, the other final thing that they found, or that I have as being found, is his brother's driver's license. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Now, Scott's defense attorney was Mark Garagos. And he thought he could exonerate Scott by having a Dr. Charles March testify. And Dr. March's theory was that the fetus had actually lived for a week more than the day they said Lacey was killed. So the theory is that Lacey was killed on the 24th, and this doctor's theory was it was a full-term fetus, so her, she must have completed her pregnancy, or at least had another week of pregnancy prior to her death, so it couldn't have been Scott that killed her. And for some reason, this Mark Garricos thought that this was going to really fix things for Scott, and he wouldn't be convicted. So this is a physician who's going to testify to that? Yes. I mean, that's just utter malarkey. Yeah. <laughs> well, can't you tell a, a fetus, well, a week's difference? Could you tell? Not really. Not really, no. No, you can't. Term fetus is anywhere from 37 to 42 weeks. Mm -hmm. And by dates, this one was 36 weeks. I believe so, yes. But there's a very teeny difference between a 36-weeker and a 37-weeker. Right. So I don't see how you can look at a decomposed fetus and say, oh, it lived a week after it was supposed to have been killed. Well, yes, and pregnancies are usually determined by the date of the last menstrual period, so they're usually not exactly on target. No, they aren't. There's a few days back and forth. You really should have a due week, not a due date. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you can say that this was a term or a near-term baby. Yes. And that's about it. I don't see any way on earth you can say, well, it's obvious that this baby lived for a week or it was a full-term baby and was alive for a week after the mother was killed. Yeah, it sure seems like a crackpot theory. I don't know why this lawyer believed it or what the doctor was talking about. I think he was just a forensic. I don't know what the doctor was talking about. He's not a neonatologist or I don't a pediatrician. So. No, I don't think so. Well, anyway, his, his testimony failed miserably for reasons that I guess you've already determined in your own mind, which well, makes know. sense to me. Did the prosecution destroy him on the stand? Or? Yes. Yeah. They did. 
well, understandably. They destroyed him pretty badly, from what I heard, to the point where at the end he was saying, hey, cut me some slack. <laughs> he actually said that. Really? Yeah. Wow. So that's not good. So what's with this defense attorney that he's pinning his hopes on this crackpot doctor? I don't know. We, I mean, we do have some questions about his competency in that we did listen to an interview with Michael Jackson's attorney from when Michael Jackson was going to court over the child molestation charges. Yeah. He had an attorney named Thomas Masrow who actually got Michael Jackson acquitted, if you remember. He did. But in this interview, he was talking about uh, Mark Garagos, and he said that Garagos was actually fired from the Michael Jackson legal team before it even went to trial. Right, and Garagos was advertising himself as the, the guy who helped get Michael Jackson acquitted. Yes, that's how he was using that as his, that he was a famous, you know, right. really good attorney. And he had yeah. nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. And this guy, this Thomas, why do I keep forgetting his last name? Thomas Mesero. He said that Mark Garagos was really incompetent. He said no. there's no, he's never done a case, a death penalty case, and that he actually, and this is an aside, I know it doesn't really seem pertinent, but I found it interesting that he defended Winona Ryder in her shoplifting charges. Right, and couldn't even get her off. Couldn't of get those. her off. She was actually found guilty of um, several felonies right. for shoplifting. So this guy Garagos doesn't have too much to recommend him. No, it seems like he was... He's, he's even got one of his brethren, another attorney, bad-mouthing him. Yes. So that's that's pretty serious. It is. I it think. Is. Yeah. doesn't seem like he did a great job. And when we get to the point about appeals for Scott Peterson, we'll see that some of Garagos' work certainly has a role in that. Now, was he the sole defender? Did he have a, a team helping him? I he think, he think was the was... lead attorney. Okay. Yeah. And, I'm, I'm sure he had someone helping him. Yeah, but nobody who was voicing any opinions. Not that I know of, no. Nobody famous. No. Nope. No. Now, the prosecution, they presented Scott's affair with Amber and money as the motives for the murder because there was a life insurance policy. I'm not sure for the amount, but there was one that was bumped up not too long before she disappeared. Right. So then... Uh, yeah, no, it was sizable enough that the payments on it weren't on the low side. I mean, he... <laughs> he was forking over a pretty good amount of money. He was. I think he was having trouble keeping up with the payments. Right. Yeah. So that's significant. So as we all know, he was found guilty, and it was on March 16th, 2005, that he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. So that's kind of a summary of the overall case. And Scott Peterson is in San Quentin prison still on death row, and he's continuing to appeal his sentence. There are many, many books that were written about this case. Let's just say that. One, one quick interjection. Sure. The fact that he's still sitting on death row, there hasn't been an execution in California for how many years? Ten, since 2006. Yeah. So it's not just Scott who's sitting on death row. There's a whole bunch of people on death row. A whole slew of them, yes. And who knows if they're ever going to enforce the death penalty. Well, it's mm. not likely that he will get the death penalty. Right. And actually, about a year and a half ago, he was moved into kind of a nicer area of death row, I guess you'd call it, where they have uh, <laughs> they have a basketball court. They have a lot more freedom. They're not just in these little cells. Yeah. So he's actually out and about. He can use a computer. He actually was blogging for a while. Oh, wow. Yep. He's working out. So, he, you know, they had pictures of him from a distance. He's very buff. He's playing sports with the other guys. And he really doesn't seem to be suffering on death row. No. No. But he's not getting out of jail. No. He is appealing and trying to, though. Right. He's trying to get another trial. Well, you're going to go into that. Yeah, we have a lot of information on the appeals process because there was a recent documentary and all that. So we're going to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. This is where, I mean, otherwise it's, this is too cut and dried. It was tried and convicted and found, found guilty yep. of killing his wife and his child. Yes. And he's sentenced to death. Yeah, and, and I, you know, until I did... But the story doesn't end there. Well, no, but until I looked into this and started reading books on it and stuff, I, I thought it was pretty cut and dry. Well, yeah. It definitely was in my mind that he killed them, that he'd been sent to prison, and that was the end of it. 
Now, I realize that he might not get the death penalty because of the appeals and all the time it takes, but I didn't realize that there were people, you know, there's always a few stray people who think someone's innocent, but I didn't realize there was this big group of people actually backing him up and trying to help him appeal and get a new trial. Right. There's a sizable number. There are, yeah. So I was just going to mention the books that we read. Let's do that. So we didn't both read them all. I read For Lacey, which was by Lacey's mother, Sharon. And this book, it talks a lot about when Lacey met Scott, you know, Lacey growing up, how Scott was kind of a part of the family and how they were so shocked and disappointed and how they did become convinced that Scott was guilty over time and why. So that was interesting. And it had a lot of emotional stuff, of course, because it's Lacey's mother sure. about Lacey. And you realize the bias there, too, because it's Lacey's mother. Absolutely, yes, yes. And then there was A Deadly Game, which is a book by Catherine Cryer. Now, this one actually tells how the police solved the crime and brought Scott to justice. So it has a very police crime-solving justice kind of slant to it. It's all about the cops and all the great stuff they did. Well, Catherine Cryer, is, she's a celebrity. She's on TV. She does, like, documentaries or yeah. 60 Minutes type shows. Yeah, kind of like a Keith Morrison or a yeah something like that. Yeah. yeah, she does that kind of stuff. But she wrote this book, which was interesting, but it was definitely in praise of the police and that Scott was just a total scumbag, which is probably true, but that's well, what... I think he is a total scumbag. Yeah, it's probably true. But she was presenting this as good police work. Yes. It was an homage to crime solving. Yeah. yeah. I'd submit that Scott was stupid enough to get caught, and it wasn't the brilliant police work that did it. It was the jerk who perpetrated it. Probably a combination somewhere in the middle there, yeah. And it was also, they also made a, a documentary, like a, an hour-long news show, quotation mark, news show, mm -hmm. about this that was called Scott Peterson Case. A Deadly Game, How the Police Brought Scott Peterson to Justice, The Inside Story. Okay. Something like that. So I did watch so, that, too, on YouTube. So another one of the Praise the Police stories. Yeah, it was. Which, you know, in many ways, police don't get enough praise. So I don't really have a problem with that. No, I think they did a good job. Yeah. And another one that I read was Blood Brother, and that's by Ann Bird. Now, she's Scott's half-sister. She was given up for adoption as an infant. She's older than Scott, and she had just met her biological family, Scott's mother and another brother who was put up for adoption and raised by another family, and Scott and Lacey. So she just met them within a year or two of Lacey's disappearance. But she was the one that Scott went and stayed with for a while. When the police were looking at him and he wanted to leave his house, he went and stayed with her in her house for a while. Right. The interesting thing is that her house overlooks California Bay. Yes. So he can he can just, anytime he wants, look out the window and see what's going on. Right, right, yeah. And I would say of the three books I've mentioned, that was the most interesting to me. Probably the most objective, although she was definitely... But she thinks he did it. Definitely. It was Blood Brother, 33 Reasons Why My Brother's Guilty, something yeah, like some, that. Yeah, some number, 30-something. Yeah. And this, in her book, she really started out thinking that he was innocent and she was totally supporting him. But it shows over time the things he does that kind of break down her faith in him. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's a good read. And then the last book was Inside the Mind of Scott Peterson, and that's by a psychiatrist, Dr. Keith Ablo. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that one? Because I feel like I've been doing all the talking here. Well, sure. And I read this book, but you read yeah. it too, right? I did, yes. But this is, uh, the first thing I'd say is that this guy can't write. He has the worst prose I think I've ever read in my life. Okay. It's so just, even as a technical writer? Even as a technical writer. It's, okay. It's just horrible. Okay. Tell us how you really feel, Dick. But <laughs> the, the story, I mean, what he's attempting to do, he's looking at things from a psychiatric viewpoint and trying to find evidence to point to how Scott could act the way he acted. Yeah. So just a little bit. Scott's mother, when she was a child, her father was murdered. Yeah, and it was like the same day. It was Christmas Eve. Yeah. 
Many and years just ago. weird stuff. Yeah. So it was a Christmas Eve. He was leaving work with money for a deposit or something, and he was murdered, and the money was stolen. Okay. And that left her mother, a widow, with four kids, three boys and a girl. And she couldn't take care of them all. So she put them in uh, basically an orphanage. And they didn't, I mean, the boys were in one part and his mother was in another part. So she didn't even see her brothers. So here she's lost her father uh, shortly after her mother puts her away. And yes. she doesn't get to see her brothers. Wow. And she was two? She was two, three, somewhere in there. So as far back as she could remember, for sure. She was on her own. And then when she was 18 and she could leave because yeah. she was an adult, her mother right. died. Oh, wow. So here she is, no father for many years. Her mother's recently died. She's been basically institutionalized for most of her life or almost all her life. Yeah. And now she's out. Now, and, did her mother have a relationship with her at all while she was in the orphanage? No. Okay. She did not. Okay. So when she had a couple kids out of wedlock, Yes. And gave them both up for adoption. And these were by different men. So, so now you're talking about Scott's mother. Scott's mother. She had Donnie and the one who wrote the book, Anne. Anne. Yeah. So Donnie's the older one. Right. By a guy who left her after she became pregnant. She gave that kid up for adoption. Mm-hmm. And then she had another relationship and produced Anne. And that guy left her. And then Anne got put up for adoption. Okay. So this, this isn't a good, healthy upbringing. Or so, life. Yeah, but this was all before Scott even came into the picture. That's the right. weird thing about it. Well, I'm just, what I'm doing, or what Ablau was doing, was kind of setting the place for showing that the upbringing that Scott had yes. was predicated on the mother's upbringing. Yeah, I thought he put a lot of weight on that. Sure. More than I really would. But I'm not a psychiatrist. So. Well, and then, so he... She she marries a guy who has three kids from another marriage that they see frequently. And she and Lee Peterson have their son, Scott. Right. And Scott was the golden boy. Yes. He could do no wrong. Right. And in Abloh's book, Scott pretty quickly figured out the way to get along with his folks was to kind of be invisible, do what they wanted, don't cross them, be the perfect child. Okay. He also had said something about Scott's infancy, where he was, he had pneumonia or something, and he was in the hospital for a while. He was. So he, there, he, he said there was a bonding issue there. Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, that in itself would be the reason. I mean, right. He was he was hospitalized for a week or so. Oh, was that all? I thought it was months. No. Oh, okay. And He made a lot of it. He did. Yeah. Because according to Abla, that's kind of the crucial time for bonding to occur. Okay. And while it, it is maybe not the crucial time, it is a time for bonding. What happens afterward? I mean, he got out of the hospital. He was fine. Yep. So there, there might not have been any real damage from him being in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Right. But my my take on Ablau's book is that the parents took a kind of a hands-off approach to raising him. They let him do what he wanted. He got to figure out that whatever he did was okay. Yes. And as long as he didn't make waves and get people pissed off at him, everything was great. Yeah. Now, what about the all that he made of the... He made a lot of this whole being dead inside, right? Remember that? Well, about, that's, that's an example of his overblown prose. Yeah, but he did say that a lot. He did. Yeah. So I just wondered what that was about, as if his parents had done something to strangle him and he started feeling trapped when Lacey got pregnant because he was always feeling kind of trapped by his parents. Yeah, I didn't take it that way. No. I, I looked at it as that uh, he, he was raised to believe that he could do whatever he wanted okay. as long as he didn't get people upset with him and that he didn't want a child. He didn't want to be married. He wanted to play around. And yeah. there's there's some big discussion that maybe he was more in love with Amber and wanted to be with her. And couldn't do that while he was married to Lacey. Mm hmm So, but I don't think I would go along with Ablau saying, oh, he was dead inside. And, and you're right, he did make that point several times. He did, yes. He actually, I thought he went really far with it because he talked about birth and death and water and how, to him, birth was the same as death. 
and of course water has a lot with being born and he actually had a theory that Scott killed Lacey in the pool because of the water and also in practical terms there would be no mess right right if he'd killed her in the water because she did say to Anne Anne said in her book that Lacey liked to go and be weightless in the pool in her later months of pregnancy. Sure. It was it felt good to do that. So that's what Ablau's theory was actually that he may have killed her in the pool. Well, that that's an interesting theory, but sure. I, I don't buy into the whole water birth death type of thing. Yeah. Well, you're a practical sort. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't don't get into that. I think he could have drowned her, or he could have strangled her or smothered her. I mean, yes. there, obviously there wasn't anything done to her that caused a lot of blood loss, because they didn't find any. Right. Well, and then I also wonder about the broken ribs. Do you think it was before she died that they said she got the broken ribs? Well, I'm not sure they can say exactly before. I mean, one thing would be if he's transporting her and he's going to put her in the boat to dispose of the body. So if it was like immediately after death, they yeah. might not be able to maybe, tell. Yeah. Maybe he kind of tossed her into the boat and she broke some ribs then. Yeah. But I don't I don't know how you can say that the rib fractures occurred anti-mortem. Well, I think by the bleeding and by the injury, you could tell, right? But I guess if it was immediately after mm -hmm. death, you might not be able to tell that from before yeah. death. I'm not sure. All right. You're right. Yeah. Curious, but... We don't know. We're not forensics experts. No. No. Okay. So what about this bonding issue? Now, you take care of babies that have been at the hospital for months after they're born, right? Preemies, stuff like that. Yeah. Do you see bonding or issues with those parents and their children? Now, I know you're not their psychotherapist, but have you seen more difficulty with these kids as they grow up? No. No. Not usually. Okay. I do see in kids that were abandoned or, or left on their own, basically from birth. Yeah. And not cared for, having problems. I mean, you, you read a lot about infants from Eastern Europe that were adopted by Americans, and they have this thing called attachment disorder. Yeah, sure. Because yeah. they've been without a lot of human contact for years and years. Right. And that doesn't seem to be the case with Scott. It seemed like his dad took him golfing and there are a lot of family pictures of them doing family things with him. Yeah. He was kind of spoiled. Yeah, he yeah. was. Okay. So I don't I don't buy into that part of Ablau's work. So you're not recommending this book? No, <laughs> okay. I'm not. All right. I'm reminded from his book of a book by Joe McGinnis, okay. who was involved in the uh, case of the guy, the army guy who murdered his wife and kids in North Carolina years and years ago. Jeffrey McDonald okay. is his name. I'm not familiar with that. And McGinnis was basically hired to write a book to show that he was innocent. And hired by family? Or? By the attorneys of the family or something. And during the research came to the conclusion that he was guilty and wrote the book that way. And that's kind of, I mean, I know Ablau wasn't hired to write a puff piece or anything. No. But I'm presuming he went into it with an open mind to begin with, and then decided that he was guilty. And once that decision's made, he's going to write his book that way. Yeah, well, I don't think that's the way you're supposed to do it. I think you're supposed to go through the psychology and then get your determination, but you're suggesting he made his determination and then made the psychology fit what he wanted it to. I think he could have. <laughs> okay. I mean, that doesn't change anything necessarily. No. Because I, I personally think that Peterson's guilty, despite the people that are clamoring for his innocence. Sure. I think a um, huge amount of the public does. I'd say an overwhelming majority. Right. Yeah. But I think that Abla might have gone in with a more open mind and decided that he was guilty and then wrote the book that way. Yeah, he might have. And I'll just say one more time, he, he just can't write. Okay. He, it's just horrible. I don't so, know if he's written other books. I so hope that's not, because I'm never going to read them. Okay. Well. I mean, I, I read this one, and every few pages I'd cringe at, at how he wrote. Yeah. And it wasn't what he wrote, it was just how he wrote it. Well, what do you mean? So, like, well, your example of the birth, death, and water. Yeah. And he goes on and on about that. He so, does go on Jesus, and on. Jesus, this is horrible. Yeah. 
Okay. Mumbo jumbo bullshit. Okay. All right, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for letting us know all about that book so that we won't read it, although I already read it. Another book about Scott Peterson, Lacey Peterson, was written by Amber Fry. And I didn't read this whole book. I did go on Google Books and I read the first chapter or whatever they let you read for free. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there was really nothing new to be found in that. I think that as far as Amber Fry's concerned, I have no problem with her. As soon as she found out, I think she did the right thing. I don't think that she had anything to do with it at all. No, I don't think she had anything to do with it. No. I think her judgment sucked. Yeah. I mean, she meets this guy and she's immediately ready to marry him. And, well, and she's found a father for her daughter. Sure, but she was in her 20s. Yeah. Which, you know, I'm not going to hold that against her. Okay. I could, the only thing I could say against her if push to would be that little bit of a media whore, a little bit, really got into well, the media she, stuff. she liked the interviews. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that was her or her attorney, I mean, because Gloria Allred, Aldred. Well, well, for sure, yeah. I mean, she loves the camera. She does, yeah. So it might have been her pushing it and not Amber. That's true, but Amber has done but, yeah, interviews up until 2015. I've seen been interviews. interviews and interviews and interviews, yeah. yeah. But it's a fascinating thing, you know, the mistress of a man who killed his wife. It's Yeah. People want to hear about it. They do. Yeah. So, you know, he'd only been dating Amber for a few weeks when Lacey went missing. And he did tell her he was unmarried. And right. the funny thing was, though, how he continued to call her and contact her afterwards. And claiming to be in Paris and all these places. Yeah, I mean, so the police, were, the police were recording the calls. And they know where he is. He's he's at a vigil for his dead wife. He's right yeah. there. Yeah. And he's saying, oh, yeah, I'm in Paris. I'm by the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, there's a huge crowd here. Yeah. Embarrassing. <laughs> really bad. Yeah. Yeah. So eventually they stopped doing the recordings because they didn't want it to look like they were framing him or what would the better word be for that, like setting him up for anything. Yeah, plus he, I think they also figured he had, they, they'd given him plenty of opportunity to incriminate himself. And he had a and, little, but he'd never confessed to anything. Right. Yeah. So maybe they just figured there were diminishing returns here and yeah. it's time to cut and leave. Yeah. Yeah, that, sounds, that makes sense. So this documentary I was talking about, it is the American Documentary Film Festival article that I read where they premiered this documentary, Trial by Fury, on the Scott Peterson trial. And it was of the mind that he is innocent. It was trying to convince people that he was innocent, that he didn't get a fair trial. Okay. So I'd ask you, how many appeals has he been through? Well, well, we'll get to that. I just okay. want to talk a little bit about this movie. Let's go with the movie then. So director Shireen Anderson presents evidence indicating that the Modesto police investigators decided Peterson was guilty early on and then ignored evidence suggesting their hy hypothesis was wrong. And it shows how a detective attempted to erase a note indicating the police had reasonable doubt about Peterson's guilt and that the detective lied under questioning by Peterson's attorney about that until Garagos showed him the note with the erased paragraph, and it was restored so that it could be read. Now, okay. Now so that wasn't enough to cause a new trial? No. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. But Garagos, this is interesting, attended the premiere of the documentary, and... Also, it presented evidence suggesting who might have actually committed the murders, besides Scott, who could have actually done it. So a witness says that she saw a burglary across the street from the Peterson house on December 24th, and the police actually caught the burglars two days later. But the burglars said they committed the burglar burglary, no, oh, what's wrong with my mouth, on December 26th, and the police believed them. Even though the media was all over that neighborhood reporting on the Peterson killings on the 26th, and you think they would have seen that going on. Mm -hmm. So the police didn't thoroughly investigate the possibility that the burglars might have committed the murders, the film suggests. Well, I mean, there's a big difference between burglarizing a house and murdering a person. 
and, sure. and murdering a obviously pregnant person. Right, right. So. But what they said is that Lacey encountered them while walking her dog, and the film showed how police led the media to believe Lacey didn't walk her dog that morning, as Scott testified. And other neighbors actually told the filmmakers that they saw her walking the dog. Now, Anderson even found a witness who claimed that she saw a pregnant woman taken out of a van and allowed to urinate, adding credence to the defense argument that she was abducted instead of killed by her husband. Now, there were three jurors who thought Peterson was innocent, and they were removed from the trial, including the foreman, who asked to be removed after claiming to have been bullied. After the verdict, TV talk show host Larry King, he asked a juror how Lacey Peterson was murdered, and the juror asked King to be more specific. King reminded the juror he had just convicted Peterson of murdering his wife, and he was just asking how Peterson did it. And the juror only replied that Peterson killed his wife in his house, even though police couldn't find ev any evidence of blood or proof that blood had been cleaned up in the house. So these are some of the things that were brought up. Well, but that doesn't say anything, that last part. Well, I guess what that is leading to is that in this case, which I think is unusual, it's what is implied by Scott's supporters, obviously, that it's unusual, that the prosecution couldn't say when she was killed, where she was killed, or even how she was killed. So that's unusual, because they're convicting him of murder, but they can't say that he strangled her, that he, you know, where he was with her, all that kind of stuff. And the only forensic evidence was that hair in the pliers. Yes. But we know that she was killed. Yes. She, she didn't just drown in San Francisco Bay. Well, yeah. And we have, again, circumstantial evidence that her body was weighted down by these cement blocks. Yeah, there's tons of circumstantial evidence. And we know that there were five blocks, but four were missing. Yes. Only one remained. Right. Yep. So. And he bought all the cement that was gone. Right. Yep. So, yeah, there was a ton of circumstantial evidence. Why don't you go over Scott's timeline? That I know they had Scott's timeline up on the um, Justice for Scott website. Yeah, I mean... The only thing I'd say about this timeline is that this timeline was developed based on numerous interviews and stories, and Scott himself changed his story several times. Okay. So they've developed this timeline that purports to show that he never had the time to do it. But there's so many different inputs to this timeline that I can't really believe the timeline. Okay. I mean, there's too much too much stuff going on in it. So you don't even think it's worthy of going over? I, I okay. don't. Okay, all I, right. I don't think it is. Okay. Well, I mean, we pretty much know what the police's timeline was. Yeah. Although they couldn't say whether she was killed the night before or the morning of her disappearance. Right. But they do believe that the cement anchors, I guess they're called, were used to weigh down her arms, legs, and probably one around her neck. And that's why the torso came up without a head or legs or hands, right? Right. And and that the fetus was basically expelled from the uterus because of the gases and stuff from being submerged. Yeah. And that's that's why they washed up separately. separately. And they could also tell that because the fetus had was not as nearly as decomposed as she was. Right which mean he'd, be, he'd been protected inside her body. For, for a time. For a length of time. Yep. Yeah. But we have no way of knowing how long that would take. No. Okay. But well, I, I guess, I mean, the, the timeline, when, when you read it, looks reasonable. But then you realize that there's so many different bits of information. So does his timeline say that he was fishing? Because he did first say he was golfing. It said he was golfing. But the, the timeline says that he decided it was too cold to golf. Oh. So he went fishing. Okay. He went fishing on a colder place, the water. Yeah. He went fishing in a place 90 miles away. Right. From where he lived. Mm-hmm. And he was an avid golfer. So I'm thinking, as a golfer, if it's too cold to golf, it's too cold to do anything outdoors. Because I'd, I'd be playing golf. Yeah. 
Well, and a lot of people argue that he wouldn't have been going anywhere because Lacey would have wanted him to be preparing for the family activities. It's Christmas yeah. Eve. Well, I, I could see if he said, I'm, I'm going to go golf because that's only a four-hour thing and the golf course is right there, mm -hmm. basically. Right, right. Now, if he goes fishing, it's an hour and a half each way and he's out in the water. So, and I could see if he says, I'm going to go golf, she says, sure be back by so-and-so because we're going to my parents house tonight yeah but that didn't happen no nope. even he doesn't say that he went golfing anymore no and there's there's people that figured that he was seen at the marina so he had to go to plan b so he had to go fishing instead of golfing yeah because he was seen at okay. the marina right right and he couldn't very well say he was golfing if uh, he was seen 90 miles away so I think he, he might have initially said he was going golfing, but it was too cold, so he went fishing. Yeah. But I think the the reason for that is that he was seen at the marina, and he needed that documented. So he bought the launch ticket knowing that he was already seen there, and he couldn't very well say, well, I was playing golf, I was never at the marina when they saw him at the marina. So he made up this story about, well, yeah, it was too cold to golf, so I, I decided to go fishing, try out my new boat and stuff. So that makes me think his initial plan was to take her body, assuming he did it, out into the water and dump it and say he was golfing, because that would have been better, because once he said he was fishing, he was that placed him where the bodies were found. Exactly. And a lot of the jurors actually said that's what cinched it for them. Well, yeah. Yeah. It, it would. Mm -hmm. See, if he had done it at some point where he wouldn't have been seen, he might have skated by. Makes me wonder if he killed her in the morning, because if he killed her the night before, he could have got out in the middle of the night and maybe not been seen. Right. I don't know, can you do that at night? Can you send, go out on your boat in the middle of the night? You can, but it's pretty dark out. So I, th I think he'd need daylight to be able to know where he wanted to dump her body. Yeah. One thing I discovered, though, just recently with, you know, learning more about it, was that his boat was actually quite small. I was picturing a larger boat. It was. Yeah. I know. We've read the same thing or heard the same thing, that it wasn't a big enough boat to be out Yeah, it was pretty fishing. small. Fishing. We wouldn't even take it fishing out in the bay. No, it just kind of looked like a big canoe. Yeah. It, it wasn't... It's a 14-foot boat. Yeah. Now, see, I'd always pictured before that he'd taken her out on, like, a houseboat or a, yeah. at least a speedboat or something. Yeah, he didn't. So that was another argument by the defense, is that it wasn't big enough and it would have capsized. And there was one of the appeals was actually based on that, that the testing of the, ba the boat's stability was incorrect. And it wouldn't have been possible for him to take the body out and dump it with those anchors and not capsize himself. So that was one argument. That didn't hold water, or or wasn't wasn't persuasive enough. No. So within the one mile radius of Lacey's house, there were actually twenty six sightings of her, and within a three mile radius, there were an additional an additional seven. I'm just going to go over these because I know you have a lot to say about eyewitness testimony, so I just want to bring this up. So this is a total of thirty three sightings. And within what, three miles? Within three miles, 26 of them were within one mile. So this was a long dog walk she took. Well, no, this wasn't, I don't think this was with the dog. This was, see what they had. This is just Lacey walking alone? Mm-hmm. Now they say that with the police that the Lacey sightings were not a priority. They kind of ignored them. And the defense attorneys did not have access to the tip sheet until May of 2003. But they did learn about some of the other sightings. A defense investigator, Tony Frietis, on January 20th of 2003, he had found several sightings on his own by doing his own research. So he called Sharon Roca and Brent Roca with this information. And an article actually appeared in the Modesto B in February of 2003. So Martha Aguiar lived only two blocks from the Peterson house and the defense learned that she saw Lacey. For some reason, the police just didn't believe these sightings. They didn't think that she was actually out and about that day. Even though many of these people were 
adamant that they had seen her. On that particular day. On that particular day. And they're positive of that. Many of them are, yes. Okay. So did the defense call all these people? Not all of them, but they did they did call several of them, yes. So why why weren't they believed? I don't know. Why okay. do you think they wouldn't be believed? Because they were vague in their description or because they didn't really see her. They just thought they saw her. They have a dog, so she is always out walking the dog, right? Yeah. I'm just thinking that they remembered seeing her at some point, not necessarily on that particular day. Yeah, but it's Christmas Eve, and that search happened that night, so you think they would know if it was that day that they saw her. So I don't know. I'm sure there are some people that just want the attention, but it's it's notable to me that that many people think they saw her. Well, and I'd turn it around. If that many people saw her alive at that point, how did he get convicted? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Maybe because his attorney was incompetent. That's one thing that people have said. And maybe the police just didn't give it enough enough weight. But the attorney called people to the stand who said testified that they saw her walking. Yes, I think they called seven people. I'm not sure of the exact number. But they didn't call nearly everyone, and I'm not no, sure why. No, but still, seven would seem to be a good number mm -hmm. that they all claimed to have seen her that day. So the jurors ignored that, or the prosecution poked holes in it, or something. Something, I guess. Now, the scottpetersonappeal.org is part of the Justice for Scott campaign, and what they have said was that a lot of the problem was that the police said that Scott allegedly lied when he didn't. On an article written in January, they said that the police rushed to judgment that Scott was guilty and assumed everything he said was a lie. So unfortunately, their belief that he was guilty completely clouded their ability to investigate the case effectively. Some of the alleged lies have been covered in previous articles, but here's a list of the ones that the police and the prosecution accused Scott of telling. So the prosecution alleged that Scott lied about his whereabouts on Christmas Eve and said he was going golfing instead of fishing. Police testimony and evidence shows that Scott never hid the fact that he was fishing. So my understanding of that is that Scott told his in-laws that he went golfing, and then by the time the police came, he'd gone back to the fishing story. Yeah. That's reasonable to me. Okay. So I think he did lie with that. Mm-hmm. And also the prosecution alleged that Scott lied about following up on a sighting of Lacey in Longview, Washington. Police testimony and evidence shows otherwise. So <laughs> I don't know. Come on. <laughs> I we, don't know about that. We know either. that he lied repeatedly to his mistress. We do know that. We have that on tape. Another thing they said was that they alleged that Scott lied about meringue and cookies being mentioned on Martha Stewart the morning of December 24th, therefore proving he wasn't really home and watching TV with Lacey at that time. So during the trial, a tape of the show was played, and Martha Stewart did indeed mention meringue cookies. So they're saying, <laughs> that seems like, who cares? you, you got to do better than this. Yeah. So I'm not going to go through the whole list, because it's... But there's a whole list of these saying that Scott lied and explaining that he really didn't lie. Okay. Which does, there's no way to prove that. It's right. just, it's opinion, it, really. It is. Yeah. Another thing that was part of the appeal was that the prosecution's argument rested on three claims about the Amber Fry affair. One of them was that Scott was obsessed with Amber Fry. The second one was Scott's obsession with Amber increased after Lacey went missing and that Scott wanted freedom from his marriage. So they say there's nothing to verify that that was true. So obsession is defined as dominating or preoccupying the thoughts, feelings, or desires of a person. And obsessive behavior would include relentless calls, over-involvement, stalking, intrusiveness, and reasonable demands and unreasonable demands upon the person. That sounds like what he was doing. Yeah does. <laughs> but they're saying in this scottpetersonappeal.org that he did not do that. Okay. No, he didn't. I, he didn't. I, I would beg to differ with that. 
He called her a bunch of times. Called her a bunch of times, yeah. So I guess that depends on your definition of relentless. Yeah, I but guess so. But he called her a lot. He told her lies when he called her. Yeah. He, he told her how much he wanted to be with her. He did. Okay. Now, phone records for the week before Lacey disappeared showed that there were 26 calls between Amber and Scott. In the week before? In the week before. Okay, so that's uh, almost four a day. So on Christmas morning, Amber called Scott twice, and then Scott returned her call. And on December 26th, Scott called Amber five times. So they're saying this is not excessive or obsessive behavior. Well, that's only two days after she went missing. What about for the next week or so? Yeah, it only goes up to the 26th, I think. So that, that doesn't tell me anything. Yeah. They're comparing a week before with the number of calls and two days after with the number of calls. Right. Uh -uh. No, not good enough for you. No. Nope. So another misconception that was brought up was that Scott told Diane Sawyer in that interview. Did you watch that interview with Diane Sawyer from Good Morning America? No. Okay. Well, he told, it says here that the prosecution said that Scott told Diane Sawyer in the interview with her that Lacey was okay with the idea that he'd had an affair because he said that he'd told her about the affair and that she was okay with it. But Scott actually told Diane Sawyer that he had told Lacey about Amber in early December. He then went on to say that Lacey was not okay with it, but it was nothing that would break them up. So he said, you know, she was okay with the idea, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything that would break us apart. Okay. Okay. My guess is that she never knew of the affair. Oh, yeah. That's, that's my guess, too. I definitely think that that's probably the case. Because, I don't know. I don't know anything about open marriages or, or anything, but I don't know how a spouse could be okay with the other spouse having affairs. Yeah, and if he had told her, why would he lie to police about it? Exactly. Unless he was just trying to keep it from his in-laws, but I think if she was missing... It's probably your concern isn't something like, you know, are your in-laws going to be upset with you? No kidding. You know, you'd kind of just be honest with the police, I would think. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because the downside is they think you did it and they put you in jail. Oh, guess what? That's what happened. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I think you could just kind of summarize how many appeals have there been. So on the Facebook page, Justice for Scott Peterson, we have the 2015 appeals. So there have been appeals that started back in, in 2006, and there have been six appeals or answering to appeals since that time. But the arguments were that there was a juror who answered some of the questions dishonestly prior to being chosen for the jury. So they were yeah. dishonest about that. Mm -hmm. Also that there was a prejudice by the media, and although there was a change of venue, the venue was not at a place where he could have a fair trial either. It wasn't far enough away. The media there was still saturated. Yeah, but, I mean, you, you just get down to the fact that none of these appeals have been upheld. Right, right. So, well, I, as we say, I rest my case. Well, I'm interested to see the documentary, though. I think it'll be interesting to see, because I always like to see both sides of things. Even though, from what I know, I'm pretty convinced that he did it. I think it seems pretty sure that he did. I still think it's interesting to see the other side of things. I, I'd be interested in seeing what the thoughts are. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure he did it. But even though I think he's guilty, I think the media probably did really zero in on him quickly. Yeah, but that goes both ways. I mean, you think it was the media looking to publicize the crime? Or do you think it was his guilt that made the media zero in on him? So you can look at that both ways. You can, yeah. That's true. But I think if we just go back a little bit to the movie Gone Girl, which, granted, it's a movie, but the media really honed in on him immediately. Sure. Because these things made him look guilty. Yeah. It can happen. Yeah, but Lacey wasn't coming back and saying, <laughs> I'm here. No, I okay. know, I know. Unfortunately, it's sad. But anyway, I think it's interesting that they have this site that this documentary's been made, what, it's like 14 years since she died, so it's been a long time. It is. For this documentary to come out. And also, at this 
at this documentary film festival, they said that there's one being worked on now, a new documentary that will be produced by Martin Sheen. Is that who I said it was? Martin Sheen? Right. Yeah. That is going to be trying to convince people that O.J. Simpson is not guilty. <laughs> now that's an even bigger stretch. That would be, I don't know if I could even watch that one. I don't plan on it. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I thought that it was all very interesting. I like to read about the appeals. And yeah. I'm going to put some of the links up for people to see. All right. Okay. So thanks for the discussion. It was a good one. Yeah. I thought we'd have a fun time. Yeah, I think that we really got some new stuff out there that maybe not everyone knew. Right. Which was my goal because I was hesitant to do this case, as you know. We will be doing, in a few days, we're going to do the case of Chuck Stewart. Yeah. Who killed his wife in Boston back in... Mid-80s. Mid, mid to late 80s, yeah. yeah. And well, then jumped off a bridge and killed himself. Yeah, so this is going to... Well, that'll be a good one to do. It will. Okay, so True Crime Brewery is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and on Google Play. And please follow us on Twitter at Tigrammer Pods and on Instagram, Tigrammer Podcasts. And if you're kind enough to give us a five-star review on iTunes, we'll read that on a future episode. We've been doing it every other episode because I'm not totally comfortable reading them. <laughs> so You're too shy about this. If you'd like to, if you'd rather send in a comment and some suggestions, I'd be even happier to read that. Yeah. But I do like getting the five-star reviews because that really helps us get more listeners. So I still want to get them. You could send a five-star review and then you could send a comment or something else for me to read. So that would be great. We still have the voicemail link on our website, so you can just go right on your computer and leave a voicemail. And anybody that wants to send beer, let me know. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, beer for a review. Of, of course. Okay, not just for drinking. Well, not just for drinking. Not just for Okay. All right. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for guys. listening. See you next time.